All right. Um, I, I want to kind of start by talking about some, some sort of theory stuff and um, tell you about uh, that I was, <clears throat> after, I left, after I left journalism, I went in 1998 to work for, um, for the other Governor Bush, Governor Jeb Bush. I went to work for him as a press secretary. And um, that's how I kind of got into the PR side of, uh, of the world. Um, that led to a, a position with another PR agency. And then I started my own in 2003. And all along, I was very frustrated by this, by this interesting dynamic, this relationship that exists between control and engagement when it comes to, to, to marketing. The idea that you can have high control but low engagement in the form of paid advertising. Now, that's the sort of thing you can have all the control you want. You can have it say exactly what you want. You even know exactly when it's going to run. There are no questions left in terms of paid advertising. The problem is you know, paid advertising on TV, for example, that's when people go to the bathroom. You know, and so I mean, like if people are not engaged when it comes to paid media. On the other hand, you have public relations where you have very high engagement. That's because the message is actually included, interwoven into the content. This is content people have sought out, which by definition means they're going to be highly engaged with the content. The problem is you have very little control with public relations. It ultimately comes down to convincing a reporter to tell your client's story in the way you want it to be told. And even then, once you've done everything, you don't know exactly even when it's going to happen. So I was looking for sort of a hybrid. Oh, and incidentally, as I was putting this together, I was trying to figure out if there is anything that's low engagement, low control. I figure like a message in a bottle would probably be that. On the other hand, the high control, high engagement would be social media. And I first discovered podcasting in early 2005 and thought this might be the way to attain all the control I want. In other words, get my client's message out there precisely and have all the engagement you want because this is, again, a situation where people are seeking the content out. Okay? And so I kind of thought, I'll just get sort of experimental with this. So in theory, if this theory is correct, that means I can create content and, and basically slice that demographic up very narrowly. So it's not even like we're trying to attract 18 to 35-year-olds, women. You can get much more specific. You can narrow it down to have a sense for the kind of education the person's going to have, the kind of income they have based on the sort of content you put out there. So if you put out content to attract these people, you can make it very specific and, and slice that, that demographic pie up very, very, very narrowly. And that way, that adds an, an, another component to it, which is, I had to kind of turn this so you can see there's, there's another axis here, what would have been the Z, which is the degree to which this is a targeted media. Social media, I realize, has the capacity to specifically target a group that you're after. But social media is another one of those things where it can, be, it can be highly targeted. And so with that in mind, I decided to do an experiment, and I created a podcast series. I call it Business Jive. What I did was I decided to kind of start with the end in mind. I thought, what would be the most interesting and valuable potential audience to have? I kind of figured that would probably be like CEOs and future CEOs of high-growth companies. These are ultimately the people who are going to have the most control over spending. So if you are a B2B company, and you want to get your message in front of, and you want to do business with high growth companies which have funding, which have capital, then you would, uh, this would, you know, in theory be the person or someone in uh, an upper management of one of these kinds of companies. So I kind of then thought, okay, what do these people like to listen to? Well, they probably like to listen to the stories of other entrepreneurs, specifically hear about their failures. Now, these are successful entrepreneurs who could look back and talk about their failures. And so I, with that in mind, I decided to do a podcast series where I went and, and every week I interviewed a, a, a different CEO of an interesting company, and one of the people that I, that I interviewed along the way was, um, was Patrick Byrne, who's a CEO at Overstock.com now. Overstock is a, is a Salt Lake company. There aren't a ton of big companies in Salt Lake, and they're probably more than you'd expect, but Overstock is one of them, so I was shocked when he allowed me to come in and take some of his time. We were going to talk for a half hour. It turned into four hours, and over the course of that conversation, he told me, taught me some very interesting things. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Patrick Byrne taught me right now. He taught me about legitimate short selling. Now, I'm only telling you this because I'm going to tell you about illegal short selling, what comes next. So I want to explain to you how this works. Now, I, I probably would not go into so much detail, but I know that you guys are, are business students, so a lot of you probably had finance, and so I think you might find this interesting. And, and any time anybody tries to explain how short selling works, it, they always say, well, there's person one here, person two. Per it's always kind of confusing. People kind of get lost. So I've chosen to use four different people to explain how this, how this works. And, and, and you'll understand why. So this guy is short, 
Okay, so you're not going to have to say which one was short again. Okay, you know he's short. Okay, so mini me short. These two, on the other hand, are long. Okay, Yao Ming and Abraham Lincoln. And, of course, Chuck Norris is whatever he wants to be. So keeping that in mind, this is how legitimate short selling works. Let's take the example of Dell. Now, back on January 6th, Dell was trading at $11. So let's say Yao Ming has a share of Dell, okay, and so does Chuck Norris. Now, Abraham Lincoln has some money, and Minimi has a few um, cents. Now, Minimi thinks that the price of Dell is going to go down. Make note that for the purpose, for the microcosm that we're examining here, there are two shares of Dell. Okay. Now, Minimi says, hey, Yao Ming, why don't you let me borrow one of your share of Dell, and I'll send you, you know, a few cents in return. And so Yao Ming says, fine, I'm just going to be holding on to it anyway. So he does that. Minimi then immediately turns around and he sells that share that he just borrowed from Yao Ming to Abraham Lincoln, who buys it for two Abraham Lincolns and one George Washington. So then two weeks later, Dell is now down to $10. This is where it was. And now you look and you see there are essentially three shares now, in the sense that Yao Ming still believes he has a share. Okay, he doesn't think that should change. In fact, his brokerage account still shows he has his share. Abraham Lincoln believes he has a share, and Chuck Norris is holding onto his share. So that, there are essentially three shares. Now, this is the, the sort of pivotal point in shorting. This is called covering. So at this point, now that Dell is down to 10, Mini-Me asks Chuck Norris if he could buy his share for $10. Chuck Norris says, okay. mini buys it for 10 and then returns it to Yao Ming. Okay. Now we're back down to two shares where we were before. Mini-Me has $1 left, and every, so everybody's happy where they are. This is the way that you can make money when the price of a stock goes down, legitimately. Okay. The price of stock, and the price of really anything, is sort of, think of it as like a balance, okay? And, and as there are more sellers, the price of the stock will go down until the price gets low enough that it incentivizes people to buy, and then, it, then equilibrium is resought. Similarly, if there are more buyers and sellers, the price goes up, all right, until more and more buyers are finally incentivized to sell and take their profits. Then you have sellers who are eager to snap it up, and then you reach equilibrium again. In legitimate short selling, the short seller has a slightly depressive effect on the price, but because every legitimate short seller eventually has to buy a share to cover the one they borrowed, that is evened out. Okay. So in the very short term, you could say short selling has a slightly depressive effect on price, but because every short seller eventually becomes a buyer, that's evened out. All right. Of course, when this trade happens, it's not many me going to Yao Ming and talking directly. They go through their brokers. So many might be with J.P. Morgan and Yao Ming with, with Goldman Sachs. Um, and so their broker is the one that actually do, do the deal. But it's, in truth, it's a little more complicated than that because you have four individuals that are all involved in this transaction. And so because many transactions are complex like that, the many broker-dealers have banded together. They created another company called the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. This is probably the most important organization in the United States that you've never heard of. This is where the vast majority of stock transactions actually take place. So all the different brokers have their accounts within the DTCC where they have money and they have stock. Many trades happen during the day, and then at the end of the day, the DTCC sort of nets them out. So most of the transacting that happens in the stock market, the clearing and settling actually happens in the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Now you know how legal short selling works. I'm going to say about illegal short selling. Okay, so it's the same situation. Everybody, everything's the same. All right. And now we get to this point. Now comes the time to cover. This is where it becomes illegal. Instead of covering, Min Mi decides he's going to remain uncovered. The opposite of covered is naked. This is where you get the term naked short selling, if you've heard this before. Instead of borrowing a share, he's going to instead send what essentially amounts to an IOU. It's called a share equivalent. It's basically the system allows for some slop to take place such that if you and I have done a stock transaction and I, for some odd reason, can't get my certificates to you immediately, there is a way for me to give you an IOU that in your broker's account statements would suggest that, those, that you have those shares. You can actually sell those IOUs. Um, and you don't know that's what you have, but that's what you have. There's some certain hedge funds that have figured out a way to use this to their advantage, use it illegally and improperly to just send out IOUs, okay? So they'll do it and they'll get paid. 
And so Abraham Lincoln would like another share. He says, here you go. He gets paid. Now we're up to five shares. Now we're up to six. Now we're up to seven. You get the idea. Now, everybody knows that, that there's a, in, in economics, you have supply and demand curves, and where they intersect is where price is. The reason why this is a problem is that the market views those IOUs as actual shares because they can be traded. They can be bought and sold. And as the supply goes up, price will always come down, okay, until ultimately you're dealing with a penny stock. This kind of short selling produces so much downward pressure on price that eventually the scale breaks and stocks go into free fall and they fail. The reason why this is the perfect crime is that nobody really knows that this is what's happening at the time because the SEC has gone so far out of its way to protect short sellers from ever having to disclose what they're doing. So as far, you know, you ask somebody, well, how did this company die? And they'll say, well, they, they ran out of, you know, cash. So, yeah, they ran out of cash because their stock price fell so low they could no longer go into the market to borrow, to grow. There could be no secondary offerings, et cetera. So especially with high-tech companies, biotech companies, where cash is so crucial, and especially on growing streams of cash built into their business model, they lose the ability to do this. You can basically get to a point where in some companies you might have more of these fake shares, more IOUs trading than legitimate shares. And this all takes place within the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Now keep that in mind because we will come back to that in just a moment. In about 2005, the SEC made an effort, sort of a tepid effort to try to address this problem. They passed a law called Regulation Show or Reg Show. Now keep that in mind as you listen to the comments that follow here by Dr. Robert Shapiro, he's got a PhD in economics from Harvard. He is an expert in this problem. He's former undersecretary in the U.S. Department of Commerce. Here's what he says about the problem. Former undersecretary of commerce Robert Shapiro works as a consultant for lawyers representing alleged victims of naked short sellers. He says as many as a thousand public companies were damaged by naked shorting in the decade it took to get reg show into the rule books. A lot of those companies are gone. A lot of them died. Uh, this was a, a fatal, a fatal attack. Now, some of them were weak when they were attacked. Some of them would have failed anyway. Others wouldn't have. Again, it's not up to the naked short sellers to decide. Um, it's up to the investors that play by the rules. You know that two of the most important events of the last of 2008 were the failures of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Now, after Lehman Brothers failed, the, the CEO of Lehman Brothers, Dick Fold, was, um, was asked to testify before Congress about this. He said, naked short selling contributed to both the collapse of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Naked short selling is an invitation to market manipulation. Now, the reason he knows that naked short selling contributed to the collapse of Bear Stearns is because Lehman Brothers was one of the brokerages that was used by hedge funds to carry out the attack on Bear Stearns. So he says this from a very unique and, and interesting perspective. Um, I, I will now want to look for just a moment also at the example of the failure of Bear Stearns. Um, this chart demonstrates the relationship between price and fails. And when I say fails, that means fails to deliver. In other words, that's the number of IOUs that are, that are injected into the system. So price in blue, fails in red. Something really interesting happens when you, you see that the, that, that the real spike in the naked shorting began on the 12th of March of 2008. Well, something really, really interesting happened on the 11th of March 2008. There was an unusually high, a very unusual purchase of um, put options. Put options are another way to profit when a stock goes down. And it was so strange, there were stories that, that ran saying, who traded 55,000 bare $30 puts on Tuesday? I mean, there were stories out there saying, who on earth did this? This was insane because the stock was trading at 65. And these puts were going to expire in seven days. The stock was trading at 65. Somebody was betting that within seven trading days that the stock was going to be below $30. It was going to have to drop $35. Whoever did this, and we don't know who it was, but if you subscribe to the right service, you only know that these, these were sold. I mean, this is literally no different from me taking out an insurance policy saying, I bet that within seven days there will be a terrorist attack out on the plaza right there. Okay. And I mean, you know, any insurer is going to say, sucker bet, whatever, sure, I'll, you know, we'll write that policy. And then it happens. Okay, so they essentially had seven days for this stock to go down $35, which was about 65% in seven days. And, well, as we know, that's exactly what happened. Whoever 
bought those puts, they knew that the next day this naked short attack was going to happen and that the result would be the destruction of Bear Stearns. So, you know, somebody knew what was coming and what, they, what was coming was this spike in the illegal shorting. Now, Lehman Brothers, here's another example. You see that, that correlation between, um, that, you know, there's this correlation between the price and the number of fails with the number of fails at the end spiking in such a way that on its last day, one out of every four shares of Lehman Brothers that was trading was, was, uh, was a failed trade, was one of these IOUs. And the truth is, they, most of them probably traded within the first couple hours so much that it would produce such a downward trend that people would find that overwhelming and ultimately start selling their own shares, resulting in a real panic. Well, because of that final week, it throws the scale of this completely off. I, I actually said, let's cut out that last week and just look at what happened for the final few days. You can see that there was substantial naked shorting going into that, so, so essentially accompanying the entire downward trend. So you see that, that you know, you basically you have a point also, you can see these rough as these, these inverse relationships is the degree of shorting begins to back off, the stock suddenly begins to trend up. Then as it picks up again, the stock starts to fall again. Every instance of, of extreme volatility, you can see here, just about coincides with, with what was going on there. Now we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna zoom in and just look at the last week. You see that there's an interesting point here where that there's all of a sudden this rally right there. All of a sudden it comes up, but then it goes back down. I don't know if you were paying attention, but that happens to be the week that the SEC put a temporary ban on naked shorts. <laughs> so it went up, and then as soon as the ban ended, it started again, you see here, and then it, it, it came back down. So, and then at the time they did that, the SEC actually said, the commission action aims to stop unlawful manipulation through naked short selling that threatens the stability of financial institutions. So they, yeah, they banned it for about 17 trading days or so. And then when it ended, that's when they finally uh, put Lehman away. Okay. And we know that, that the result of that was, as the Wall Street Journal said, Lehman's demise triggered cash crunch around the globe. The economic problems we're having right now are a consequence of this. Okay. So, now, one could say that, and this is completely true, that Lehman had made some very unwise decisions, particularly with regard to subprime, the subprime mortgage thing, and complete truth to that. These guys, there were some real potential liabilities on their books. It was a house of cards, you could say. In fact, it's not even like that kind of house of cards. It's more like this kind of house of cards. That, by the way, is the largest house of cards in the world. That was, uh, but markets have ways of working these things out. And, and so it's the sort of thing where, you know, potentially maybe these guys could have had a soft landing. But we'll never know because the naked short sellers did this to the house of cards. In both cases, during the course of a week, billions of dollars of, of, of liquidity were essentially burnt. So Patrick Byrd, that he taught me about all those things. Now let me tell you about some of the other things he's been saying. This is a little quick, kind of a three minute video, sort of a compilation of things that he has been saying going back to 2005. Naked shorting plus too much cheap credit is going to equal disaster. I think that this is the just the tip of a much bigger scandal that is I want to in. stop. I think that there is something going on in the American marketplace that has to be stopped. When it comes to light, it's going to be something that makes Enron look like a tea party. Well, and that, that's a pretty get, powerful thing to say. I mean, Enron was well, a hundred plus billion dollar company. This is bigger. Regional. As I've become uh, convinced over the last year that there's some kind of systemic risk at work, there is a chance that we've got uh, you know a dozen revcos or more buried in the system, and they're all and if they revco, we're going to see an Enron-like collapse. What are they doing? The where? Forget about some overstock. It has nothing to do with overstock. I'm involved in this because of I think that there's a systemic risk here. All right. Well, you're very passionate about.
Long overdue. I think that we're living at the edge of a 1929 kind of disaster. I'm in the wrong place to say that. Uh, I think that we've been living in a house of cards for about six years. I think that the American economy is like an old man in an oxygen tent that you flood with oxygen and keep him up. But you turn off the oxygen, he fades very quickly. Well, the, the cheap oxygen in our system has been cheap credit. I think house of cards? I think our economy is a house of cards. That's obvious. We're looking at the edge. We're on the edge of a global financial meltdown, I believe. So you're expecting recession in the U.S. and you're calling it a meltdown? Yes, in fact, I think that the statistics that are coming out from the government now are, are basically half truths. I always judge the market based on what it does. It's a self-evident machine. I don't claim to be any, you know, and if you look at the past five years, they have been spectacular. Uh, I, so I find it curious that you don't see that, or that you don't give that more credit. Well, they, I mean, I, I give the markets credit in general. Not but just they, the markets, but the economic prosperity. Well, I think that prosperity has largely come from, we've been writing the checks on the bank account of future people. In one way or another, the Fed and the Treasury have been inflating this economy with cheap credit for about five years longer than they should have, and I think it's all going to come to a pretty ugly end. Well, we got to talk about Here, the real issue here is the United States is like a it's like an old man in an oxygen tent that you flood with oxygen and he comes you think he's okay well if you turn off that oxygen he's going to fade much quicker than anybody thinks in our case the the oxygen has been cheap cheap money I think that there's something just like the more the mortgage-backed security crisis and that is basically some banks have been caught selling the same share of stock right. to five different Does people. That behave this is what he was saying now. One of the reasons why you probably didn't hear much about this was because this is how the media was portraying what he was saying. And this goes, this was a, this is kind of an old picture, Patrick. The New York Post did a story about these things he was saying, and they photoshopped it literally to look like this. Here's another one. This is a, this is a picture of Patrick holding a, something that, that Overstock uh, sells. And at one point, Patrick did a kind of high-profile presentation where he basically compared the way hedge funds were operating. They were working in a coordinated way to destroy these companies. He, he compared them to it being like a, he used the term Sith Lord, referring to, you know, kind of a shadowy figure who kind of coordinates them from the something, you know, from the Star Wars movies. And so the New York Post, with no disclaimer or anything, this is how, this is how they, they photoshopped the image. And, and so that's reality, and that's reality on the New York Post. The reason why you haven't heard about this, in part, was because this is how the, the financial press, specifically New York financial press, have taken and basically repackaged and presented um, what Patrick's had to say to the rest of us. Well, there were, there were many people who were aware of this problem, and they got fed up with trying to get the message out through traditional channels, so they started blogging. They, and they were very critical of the, of the financial press. They were very critical of the DTCC and of the other laws that made this possible. There's, a, there's one particularly called the Sanity Check, which was just shockingly successful and popular. Another one called investigatethesec.com. Well, so they started really, they became very prominent trying to raise attention of these problems. Well, about that time, these same journalists that they were complaining about, they got kind of tired of that. So they actually, there was a conference that was held. It was held by the Society of American Business Editors and Writers called SEBU. And they had a whole panel just on this idea of how to combat these terrible bloggers. We knew this was happening, so we actually sent somebody in covertly to record the thing. And it is, it is amazing. I mean, and I wish I could play the whole thing for you, but I've, I've never done the one clip for you now. This guy, Dan Colarusso, was the business editor of the New York Post, the same paper that put those doctored images of, of Patrick Burnup. This is what he had to say when talking about how to deal with these, these terrible blogs and, by extension, Patrick Byrne, who everybody believed was the one who was actually behind all of them. I think about Patrick Byrne, I mean, you know, we have barrels of ink and stacks of money and all the resources in the world at our disposal, uh, legal um, and, and via our, you know, our media, to crush them. Yeah, we're going to crush Patrick Byrne for these things. This is what the business editor of the New York Post said. Okay. Well, then on January 22nd, 2006, many things changed on that day. First, let me tell about this fellow named Gary Weiss. He's a guy who, who had been a, a senior writer at Business Week. He wrote a very important article, I mean, one that's very important in terms of its reference frequently, called about the mob on Wall Street. 
He wrote a book called Born to Steal, again about the mafia on Wall Street, and another one called Wall Street versus America. And he also, at one point when he was at Business Week, wrote an article, um, a commentary called Don't Force the Shorts to Get Dressed. It was essentially in defense of naked short selling. On the 19th of January, 2006, he started this blog. And for the first two or three days, he just kind of blogged about general sort of businessy things. You know, like so-and-so has a great column here, or she says this, et cetera, et cetera. But then, on the 22nd of January, all of a sudden, he took a very strange turn in a different direction. He started talking about naked shorting. And his position is basically best summarized here. It's highlighted. First, let's be clear about something. Short selling, naked or not, is good for investors. And then he goes on to make a case for why naked short selling is great and why anybody who says otherwise is crazy. They're probably actually a fraudster, really. They're just trying to otherwise defraud you by inflating the price of a company. And naked shorting is the only way to um, defeat that. This is when everybody first kind of became aware of him. Like, who on earth is talking this way? It was very strange. Well, then that same day, all of a sudden, the New York Post reviews Gary Weiss's forthcoming book. It hadn't been published yet, but the New York Post uh, reviewed it nonetheless. Now, there's one, this paragraph is interesting, the most provocative argument in Weiss's book is that naked shorting or short selling a company stock without being able to borrow it first per long-standing rules is not only a good idea, but a necessary one. And then he goes on to write, this is guaranteed to send overstock CEO Patrick Byrne and other disciples of his stop naked short selling crusade. Weiss dismisses a lot as a baloney brigade into further spasms. Now, What's really interesting is, he says coming soon, that book was not to come out for two and a half months. Now that's ridiculous. Nobody reviews a book two and a half months before it comes out. Nobody does. I've spoken with, with publishers. They say that's actually a bad idea. And Roddy Boyd, the guy who wrote this, happens to be the same guy who wrote those two stories and whose boss is Dan Colarusso. Okay? I don't know if you're kind of beginning to see a friend here. So then, on the same day, on the Yahoo stock, on a Yahoo stock message board, uh, Lamborghini 751 was, uh, that account was created. And the first thing he does is point everybody to the, the review, uh, the New York Times review of Weiss's book. But then it's interesting, as he went on during his career, he would say interesting things like, Weiss is one of the most respected financial journalists in the country, talking about Gary Weiss. And then he would say things like, Weiss is a distinguished investigative reporter who has an untouchable reputation. I'll, I'll, you know, kind of this real consistent, interesting theme like that. The next day, on the 23rd of January, the DTCC all of a sudden starts putting out written rapid-fire press releases about naked short selling, attacking um, critics of naked shorting, basically saying things like, regulation show is working. Um, they put it out again the next day. Then the next day, Weiss also blogs on the DTCC out of nowhere, basically saying, you know, it's a staid Wall Street processing collective that is a boogeyman for many a naked shorting fantasy. That's interesting. So then... The next day, too, DTCC, they, they're criticizing somebody, I mean, out of nowhere, like a, some, an academic had put out a paper that criticized the DTCC's handling of naked shorting, so they put out another press release attacking that. Three days later, the DTCC corrects misrepresentation on naked short selling litigation. That same day, Gary Weiss, once again, he's blogging about the DTCC's press release, and um, then a couple weeks later, another blog shows up, nobody had ever heard of it before. The blog is called Mediocrity. It spends most of its time actually criticizing media that it views as being too pro-Palestinian on the Israel-Palestinian issue. And so then out of nowhere, it comes up and says, starts attacking Patrick Byrne. Patrick Byrne, again, goes on to another blog called Israel Pundit and says, one frequent locale of anti-Semitism on the web is um, a stock message board of overstock.com whose CEO is the anti-Israel Yahoo Patrick Byrne. Who is this guy? I mean, who's, who's all of a sudden this person calling Patrick Byrne anti-Semitic? Nobody ever heard of this blog before. Meanwhile, on Wikipedia, there's an article on naked short selling. On January 27th of 06, somebody shows up and starts making substantial changes to it. Makes it, instead of being an illegal practice, it's now a controversial practice. Instead of considered a device to depress stock prices, it's now viewed by its critics as a device. And then... However, its alleged depressive effect upon share prices has been widely exaggerated. So there's all of a sudden these odd kind of, and this is basically, this is sort of echoed through the rest of the article on Naked Short. And then at the very end, he adds some external, who, you know, this editor added some external links, including a Business Week article on Naked Short Selling by Gary Weiss, and two other links, which both go to dtcc.com. One of the things that makes Wikipedia so compelling for me is that it keeps a very thorough record of every edit that's taken place. 
the time it took place, and the substance of the edit. Now, if you've been on Wikipedia and if you actually create an account, every edit that you make is attributed to that account. And so you'll see, for example, Badani, you know, this edit was by Badani, this is by Manton Moreland. But then if you haven't logged in or you haven't created an account, it's attributed to your IP address. Well, the person who made all those edits I just pointed to on, on the Naked Short Selling article was initially only identified by an IP address, and that's what it was. This was the final edit of that IP address, and then a few minutes later, the first edit of Manton Moreland is registered. Manton Moreland just picks up right where the IP address had left off, and it's, it's, it's obvious if you look at it, that Manson Moreland was that IP address, okay? So that IP address said, I'm, I'm, I'm really having fun here. I might as well create an account. And so went and created an account, named himself Manson Moreland, and then, and then continued on like that. I was very curious about this at the time, and I actually had a sense, just based on the fact that he was, he was linking to Gary Weiss's blog, and then also this editor linked to um, the DTCC on two occasions. Gary Weiss had been blogging about the DTCC that same day, so I decided to do a little experiment. Gary Weiss has, uh, he moderates his blog comments, which means you can make a comment, but he reviews them before they go up, and so it gives him a chance to just, he would disregard any that didn't agree with him. I put a comment up, which included a link to Business Jive, you know, my website, and, and I, I, I kind of formed the link in a very specific way with certain letters in uppercase and certain letters in lowercase, and then um, figured that because he moderates his blog comments, he would be the first, if not only person, to click on that link. And then I could go look at my, at my server logs and see what IP address clicked on that link. And so I did that, and sure enough, that, that, that link came back with the very specific letters in uppercase and lowercase. I mean, it couldn't have just been some person typing it in like that. It was, it was the same IP address from Wikipedia. I, I said, okay, okay, now I know Manton Moreland is that guy who's Gary Weiss. So then I did the same thing. I thought, well, he's, if he's done it one place, he's probably done it another. I do the same thing. I go to the message boards. And I figured out how to disguise links using like shorturl.com and things like that. But the problem is because you couldn't be certain that only the person you were hoping would click it would be the only one, you'd get a lot of clicks. Um, I did on three different occasions. I put it up and have it linked to a page that had some kind of anti-naked short-selling information in it and then wait for Lamborghini 751 to come back and say, ah, more bullshit from you, you psychotic people. And then I would compare the timing of his comment with the timing of the hits on my server log, and I, could, I, could, I figured out, again, that same IP address was also Lamborghini 751. That was him. And there were others, too. Now, we know that as far as bloggers are concerned, he had GaryWeiss.com. Okay, that's where he does his blogging. What about mediocrity? Is there any chance that was him, too? Well, yes. I'll show you how I figured that out. Gary Weiss, in 1995, put on, did an article. In fact, it was a cover story in Business Week all about online investing. And down, way down toward the end, he writes, my AOL address, and this is 1995. I mean, I don't think he had any idea what he was doing. He's giving everybody his, his email address in the, in the article. My, my AOL address is GaryWBW at AOL.com. Well, about 10 years later, in 2005, he starts using Gary WBW when he's posting on, um, on Usenet uh, discussion groups, okay? And nothing about finance. It's mostly, again, about Arab-Israel issues. So that's Gary WBW. Well, if you look at Usenet posts, if you look at the header, there's a way you can see the IP address of the poster, okay? And so I was able to see that Gary WBW was also used to name Dave Umansky, and Dave Umansky was always kind of saying, good job, Gary WBW, you know what you're talking about, and on and on. And then, and then Dave Umansky then would also at times share the same IP address within the same few minutes as Ted Dickler was his name. Ted Dickler would do the same with Cat Allergist. Then Cat Allergist also shared the same one with Rick Ruby. Rick Ruby was on Usenet saying, oh, by the way, I just started this message, this new blog called Mediocrity. Now, it gets even more interesting than that because it turns out Cat Allergist was the nickname of Marty Ross, Amazon reviewer Marty Ross, who, it just happens, loved Gary Weiss's book and gave it five stars because it's definitely a case of ready, aim, and fire. Weiss scores a bullseye. Okay, so that, that's Marty Ross. He loves Gary Weiss's, both of his books, and he hates all the books of all these people that Gary Weiss has argued with publicly, you know, in other settings. Well, interestingly... There's also an Amazon reviewer named Ted Dickler, who loves Gary Weiss's books. 
Now, there's also a guy who just goes by George, and he loves Gary Weiss's books, and he hates all the same, all the same people who've written books that Gary Weiss doesn't like. Now, there's also another Amazon reviewer named Chuck Tatum, who is interesting because if you look at Mediocrity's Technorati profile, you know, this Mediocrity blog was claimed by Chuck Tatum. So we have another connection there. And then Jim O'Reilly is another Amazon reviewer who, um, if you look at his Amazon profile and then you have an option to click on his wish list, you see that uh, it actually says this is Gary Weiss's wish list. And there were actually several others too. So the majority of the positive reviews of Gary Weiss's books were actually written by Gary Weiss himself. Now that doesn't offend me quite as much as the fact that these, all these same identities he created on Amazon would then go and absolutely thrash the books, you know, put just terrible reviews of people that Gary Weiss had issues with in, his, in, his, in real life. So time went on. Between February and May of 06, Gary Weiss managed to retain control of the Naked Short Selling article. He gained control of the articles on Patrick Byrne and Overstock.com. He created the article on himself and uh, took uh, complete control over it. He went through Wikipedia adding dozens of links to his book. I mean, anywhere he could find an excuse to put him, he did. And then he got friendly with Slim Virgin. Now, I'm going to tell you about Slim Virgin. You thought this was all interesting up till now? No. Well, I'm just getting started. Anybody here ever play World of Warcraft? You know how it works. You like the more you play, the more experience you get, the more powers you get, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, before I tell you about Slim Virgin, you need to see this little clip from an episode of South Park that was uh, actually about um, about World of Warcraft. Oh crap! It's that guy again. Who is this? This is the guy that kept killing us last night after you went to bed. He's a way higher level than us. It isn't fair. It's all right. He can't kill us unless we agree to duel. Oh, oh, oh. oh my god! He killed Kenny! You bastard! <laughs> Don't you have better things to do than going online killing people? No! I don't want to be shot over the graveyard! No. <laughs> that son of a bitch! So, on In World of Warcraft, that guy essentially is mirrored on Wikipedia by Slim Virgin. Now, this is the actual image she uses for herself. This is her username, Slim Virgin, okay? In that, in, if you go in to watch that, uh, that episode of South Park, you see that, that one of the real vexing issues with this guy, she's become so powerful that even the administrators of the, the company that, that they put people behind World of Warcraft, he's so powerful, they can't even control him. And so, it, you know, Hilarity ensues. It's a really funny episode. You should watch them. Anyway, just to, I just, just to give you an idea of, about the nature of Slim Virgin, and I'm going to come back and explain more of this later. This is, this is an editing pattern. This is kind of a technique I developed for kind of trying to figure out with two people that claim to be different people in Wikipedia, the same ones. And that's where you, where you take their whole edit history and you put the time of day um, along, the, along the X um, ordinate and the, the, the date on the Y, and then you just do a simple scatter graph. And you'll see that, you know, people have to sleep. You see that, like, this is basically, this is sleep, all right? This is wake. And, and this whole thing is pretty typical. That's pretty normal. Now, I'm going to show you some virgins editing pattern. That's it. There's no identifiable sleep pattern, no wake pattern, and that is crazy. This was her approach to Wikipedia, basically. It was nonsense. There were, in fact, there were many times where we found her editing up to 27 hours in a row with no more than a five-minute break. Now, you remember, like, a few years ago, you'd always hear about some kid in Korea who would, and played so much World of Warcraft, he'd die in front of the thing. We kept waiting for that to happen to her, because it was like, she was so obsessed with this. She'd just edit all the time, and became, over time, so unusually powerful in a strange way. She gained, kept getting, you know, advanced to new levels, given new abilities to, to delete things, and to delete people, and block people, and all that. Um, now, at the same time, the way she got, the way Gary Weiss got friendly with Slim Virgin is he was helping to create, when he wasn't working on, when he wasn't editing the naked shorting stuff, he, he, he was editing stuff relating to Israel and, and the, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And, and he at one point um, got together with Slim Virgin and they worked together to try to create a category in Wikipedia called anti-Semitic people. If they labeled somebody an anti-Semitic person, there would actually be a little label put on that person's article that says this is an anti-Semitic person. And so they created that for a while. They put people like, they actually got Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther added to it. Mel Gibson, uh, Menajad from Iran, which is probably, he'd probably label himself that. But, you know, but 
so you know, like um, Louis Farrakhan, they worked really hard to get that to, to essentially make it sort of official. So Wikipedia officially views this person as anti-Semitic. That's how Gary Weiss and Slim Virgin got to be good friends. They, Gary was always kind of there to get her back, and he was sort of the grenade lobber when it was something just too extreme for her to do. I one day kind of had an aha moment when I was looking at all this, and I realized, what's happening here? Gary Weiss is preparing a way to officially label Patrick Byrne anti-Semitic. I realized that's what he was going to do. And that's what, you know, the stuff that was happening with the mediocrity blog, et cetera, it all kind of came together. He was trying to find a way to get to Wikipedia to officially label Patrick Byrne as anti-Semitic. And you can imagine the effect that would have on somebody trying to um, navigate their way through Wall Street, whether Jewish or not. I mean, that's like, if I didn't know any better and I heard somebody was anti-Semitic, that would repel me. So this is what was happening. This is what he was trying to do. So I decided I had to do something about it. So I created my own account. Um, Word bomb is what I called myself. And I decided I needed to out Gary Weiss as Manson Moreland and get him away from Wikipedia so he couldn't do what I could see he was, he was intending to do. But this brings up a really kind of a difficult paradox in Wikipedia. There are two rules. There are conflicting rules. One says that you cannot be, have a conflict of interest in your editing. So, and up to that point in 2006, all that the media had ever heard about Wikipedia was so-and-so was caught editing their own article. You know, you can't do that. I heard about this all the time. But so there's a rule that says no conflicted editing. But there's another rule that says you can't out other editors. You can't assign their real name. I don't know if you could tell me how, how those two rules can coexist. They can't. But I didn't know about the no outing thing. So I just went out and I did it in a real clumsy way. I didn't know any better. I didn't go about it the best way possible. But I basically went and I edited the Gary Weiss article to say, and he's also Wikipedia editor, Manson Moreland. Well, out of nowhere comes Slim Virgin, okay? And what I what I've since figured out is, is Gary Weiss had gone and asked Slim Virgin for help. And in terms of which of these two was, you know, the no conflicted editing versus no editing, which of the two was going to be enforced? Well, they weren't going to enforce conflicted editing, which means that I was the one technically in violation based on that interpretation, which means that I was immediately banned, like like 30 minutes into my editing career on Wikipedia, I was banned. And Gary Weiss was essentially had this force field of protection put around him. He became officially under her protection based on this no outing rule. He became immune. But the problem is I realize now that I wasn't going to be able to just take out Gary Weiss. Now I had to first take out Slim Virgin, which is like trying, those kids trying to take out the guy with, you know, I'm like, there's no way. Well, that's, you know, right about then is the time I created my own blog, antisocialmedia.net, figuring there's, there's got to be a way to sort of document these abuses that are taking place on Wikipedia, on blogs, etc. That's when I created it. But I thought, well, anyway, let's see if we can pull this off. Well, going back to when I first started paying attention to Wikipedia, I noticed they have these, their licensing requires that they, they make all the content of Wikipedia complete with every edit. It has to be made available on a regular basis. That's kind of a requirement of the, of, the, of the licensing. I would go and I would, I would intermittently download those things, say one day I'm going to be very glad I have an entire record of how Wikipedia looked, the entire thing on this day. Okay. I didn't know exactly how it was going to become useful, but I knew someday it would. And it did. What I was able to do was, was go back and, and I, would, I would look at, look at an old version of Wikipedia, compare it with the current or intermediate version, and put it in a, in a database. and um, and then was able to find that over time, certain edits, because it has to keep track of every individual edit, certain edits would be removed very quietly. No note would be made of it. What was done intending for it to be a way of obscuring um, misbehavior on the part of whoever did it ended up, for me, being a great, very convenient red flag, saying, look at this. You know, whatever's been removed here, there's something, there's something you, have to, you have to look at. So I did this. I, I did this, and I found that in the case of Slim Virgin, it was very revealing. I put up a post called The Skinny on Slim Virgin Sock Puppetry. Sock puppetry is where the same individual pretends to be more than one for the purpose of feigning support for a certain thing and making it look like there's more support for something than there really is. Um, and on Wikipedia, it's considered a, a big no-no. You're not supposed to do it. So I went through, and I, I looked at how, at the original um, record of Wikipedia, and then I compared the same set of um, edits to the same article with how it looked on that day and saw there were several that were missing. Starting here, the earliest, there was an IP address. And then Slim V became Slim Virgin. 
etc. Now, the reason these were gone was because it would become obvious to anybody looking at it like I was that, that, that this, you know, that that IP address was Slim B, who was also Slim Virgin. Now, if you go and look at another completely unrelated article, you see the same sort of thing happened, only in that case, it was another user called Sweet Blue Water. Sweet Blue Water and Slim Virgin were the same, and they on other occasions would, would you know, pretend to be different people. So Slim Virgin, I caught her doing exactly the same thing she's, she's banned dozens of people for doing in the past. So I blogged about this. And even though she's as powerful as she is, she still has some enemies. In fact, maybe for that reason. It sort of became this incident where they, they said, look, this is a violation of policy. And so they were linking to antisocialmedia.net. Anybody who's, who knows Wikipedia very well knows this is sort of the way, the markup which demonstrates when changes have been made. So what's in red here is what's missing there. And this is one of Slim Virgin's biggest defenders. And you see that she would, they would come up and anytime anybody would link to any social media, they would immediately come in. You see, look at the time. It's within the same minute. They would immediately come in and remove the link. And so that was a little annoying. And they knew that they couldn't keep up, they basically couldn't keep up that pace all the time. So they decided to formalize it. So what they decided to do was, was basically codify the fact that not only would they go up and immediately delete any reference to antisocial media, but they wanted to make it official by actually creating a script which would automatically ban anybody who added antisocialmedia.net to Wikipedia. Now, just to add some context here, it's OK to link to NAMBLA, all right, which is a site, NAMBLA.org probably, which is a site that basically promotes pedophilia. That's OK. And it's OK to link to a site called Stormfront, which is a white supremacist site. And there have big, there been big debates on that when ultimately they said it's OK. And it's OK to link to other sites which espouse all kinds of misogyny, anything you can imagine. They wanted to make antisocialmedia.net the only website that you could not link to from Wikipedia. So much so that it wouldn't even be a matter of somebody coming up and cleaning up after you do it, but that a script would automatically ban you no matter who you are if you, if you did it. I mean, it was the strangest thing. So, so they instituted this whole process. They called it bad sites, it's the sites that can't be linked to. So they, they, what they did first was they blocked, they made it so nobody could edit from my neighborhood or I was at this point working at overstock.com, or overstock.com. So nobody, nobody in my neighborhood could edit Wikipedia, nor could you do it from overstock.com. And so anybody who tried to basically got this warning, which said that, sorry, you're blocked from editing because this is a favorite open proxy of Judd Bagley. So my neighbors, my neighbors are trying to edit Wikipedia, calling me, wondering why they can't because of me, you know, and my coworkers too. And the person who did that was this guy named David Girard. He's the, he's the Wikipedia press spokesman in Europe. He's also like, he's executive director of the, of like the Wikimedia Foundation chapter in, in the UK. And does anybody recognize the guy sitting next to? That's Jimbo Wales. He's the founder of Wikipedia. Okay. So then they, um, they created an article on me. They put a link to antisocialmedia.net in it. Then they immediately removed the link and then launched arbitration in order to brand antisocial media, that the first bad site, okay. And then they went through and banned pretty much anybody who dissented was immediately banned. And um, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But what's even better is that they also said, even though we're debating antisocialmedia.net, the prohibition against linking or mentioning antisocialmedia.net was still in place. So you have this huge debate over a thing that nobody could mention. Now, there was a, one of the people who took a dissenting voice on this made herself heard. Her name was G-Debt. And she, she kind of um, challenged sort of one of Slim Virgin's friends on this by basically saying, would it be fair to say that Wikipedia's current working definition of a word bomb sock puppet is anybody whose edit focus, either wholly or in part, on naked short selling related articles and who opposes Manson Moreland and Semi Harris? Semi Harris was also Gary Weiss, by the way. And so the, the other guy said, basically, yes. She says, of course they're common traits. My question is whether they're enough for a positive ID. He says, I would say so. In other words, they were banning people only because of their opinion. Oh, if their opinion mirrored mine on this issue, that was enough for them to be eliminated from Wikipedia. Okay. So then, along the way, Slim Virgin creates this private email list. It got so ridiculous, and people started g giving me um, the email that was sent back and forth on this. On one occasion, Jimbo Wells wrote, I just want to go on record as saying I believe that Manson Moreland is in fact Gary Weiss. So he knew, okay. But about a month and a week later, when somebody else was kind of trying to make an issue of it, 
Jimbo Weiss, Jimbo Wales <laughs> showed up and um, basically stopped the debate and told this guy, I fear you've been manipulated by lying stalkers and trolls. Now, if you read the context of that, you know the lying stalker and troll is me. So publicly, he's saying, I'm lying and I'm a stalker and a troll for claiming Gary Weiss is Manton Moreland. But privately, he tells everybody he knows it's true. This is Jimbo Wells, the guy who, the, you know, the founder of Wikipedia. Well, ultimately, Weiss did have his downfall, and I'll tell you how it happened. A few months later, finally, the situation got so bad that it was agreed that there was going to be an official kind of an arbitration to look at all the evidence on the Gary Weiss, Manson Moreland issue. So many people came out, and we all found ourselves with, with an odd challenge, and that was because of the, the antisocial media, the fact that there was the ban in place, you couldn't mention it. You, nor could you mention any of, the, um, any of the evidence that I had put up on any social media. So nothing that I had used to prove this so far could actually be published, could actually be put up on Wikipedia. You couldn't do it. So we had to go find all new evidence to demonstrate this, this link. And we had all these guys, all these statisticians came up, and they did all these analyses, and they created all these graphs demonstrating the likelihood that, that these people that were believed to be Manson Moreland, Gary Weiss, were the same person that they would edit together was so high, the, the you know the coefficients of probabilities. It was all, I mean, actually, it's more than I even understand. But it was it was very everybody agreed this is more than had ever been done, ever been undertaken at any time to try to prove this sort of thing. But the one that ultimately did it was when we um, put out there this thing that showed his editing habits, his editing patterns, and the fact this really this that that anomalous patch right there turns out. During that exact period, Gary Weiss was in India, and we know that because he wrote a column for Forbes right then where he, with Dateline, Barkala, India, right during that period where he, and he goes on to talk about why he's in India. So his editing shifted during that point to coincide precisely with the time zone in India. And so this was the thing that finally, finally convinced people that, that of, of what we had been, uh, that, that Manton Moreland was in fact Gary Weiss. This was the thing that finally did it. And so everybody's really excited thinking this was going to be it. And what we were hoping was that the simple solution would be Gary Weiss would be blocked from having access to any of the two million articles on Wikipedia. That was just on the verge of happening. But then um, Jimbo Wales shows up. Nobody asked him, but he still said, I personally have seen no persuasive evidence that Gary Weiss is Manson Moreland. And that was essentially his way of saying, you better not do this. Instead, the solution they came up with was, it wasn't a matter of bl blocking Gary Weiss from those two main articles. Instead, a little piece of Wikipedia was put off over there, and everybody else was blocked from it. They made it so they said, in order to edit those four articles, you have to jump through all these hoops in order to do that. Those rules only apply for those four, for nobody else. Consequently, nobody wants to touch them. And so to a large degree, they still reflect the flaws that Gary Weiss put there. So that was their solution that they came up with was the disinformation that he inserted into those four articles was, was going to persist. Now, the good news is everybody else was convinced of what I'd been saying. Consequently, even Slim Virgin found him a little too radioactive, and she even withdrew her support from him. He lost his little force field of protection, and he was on his own. And fortunately, about three weeks later, he screwed up and he accidentally let his IP address show through. And so on March 12th of 2008, that was it. He was finally banned. So Gary Weiss, it took all that effort. We had to first take care of Slim Virgin, and then we could finally take care of Gary Weiss, but we did it. So now the question becomes one of motive. A lot of people wonder, why would he go to all this trouble? Well, the answer to that can also be found in Wikipedia. In the editing history of, a, of an article on a certain Catholic parish in, um, in Greenwich Village, Anybody who analyzes Wikipedia editing histories would look at this and tell you what I'm about to tell you. Anytime you see an article, you know, created by one person and edited exclusively by that person, except for one IP address kind of tucked in the middle, that is this person who forgot to log in for some reason. So for some reason, they didn't log in, and so their IP address shows through. Does anybody want to guess what that IP address belongs to? It is... The Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. This place is Fort Knox. I mean, you can't, it has armed guards. You cannot, it's not like you can just show up and say, hey, let's go to lunch. I'll sit and play solitaire while I'm waiting for you. And maybe I'll edit Wikipedia. It's so secure. And yet Gary Weiss was using a computer at the DTCC. Okay. So we then were basically able to put it all together and realize this is our theory, that the DTCC, 
that they were tired of getting battered by all these bloggers. And they realized they had to put together a PR offensive to counter the way they were getting hammered on the naked short selling issue. They decided to recruit a blogger of their own. Okay? And that blogger was Gary Weiss. All right. and they then went further and said, okay, now so you, you, know, you blog about us, link your blog to us, keep talking about us, you know, make it relevant, go into the message boards, go into Wikipedia, et cetera, et cetera. Which also explains why he's so pro naked shorting. And this is the same entity that knows exactly who's doing the naked short selling. That's the, the hub in the wheel. Very, so when we, when we figured this out, I, was, I blogged about it and I asked the, um, I asked the DTCC uh, spokesman for um, comment. Well, it didn't come. It didn't come after days and days and days. I kept bugging him, kept bugging him. It didn't come. Um, he would send me an email, but it would, there'd be nothing in it. And I kept bugging him, kept bugging him. Finally, I got a response from the DTCC. But this is probably the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. It didn't come from the DTCC. It came from Roddy Boyd, who, as you'll recall, is the same guy who wrote both stories and whose boss is the one who says they want to crush Patrick Byrne. And he wrote me and he said, Judd, I spoke to corporate communications at DTCC. They told me on the record that Weiss is not, or has he ever been employed to use, I mean, this real over-the-top denial. They categorically reject it, blah, blah, blah. Um, he says, that's a big hump for a real reporter to get over. Let me put this politely. As an investigative reporter, laughably for Patrick Byrne, you're really a much better PR person. Now, the, the day a journalist, as I consider myself in this context, gets official comment on something, not from the person who, from whom you're seeking the comment, but from another reporter. Keeping in mind, again, Roddy Boyd is also the guy who wrote that. He wrote the, the two and a half month early review of Gary Weiss's book. He just kind of keeps showing up in this, and his editor keeps showing up in this. You know with certainty something really strange is happening there. So here are the lessons to be learned from all this. The real strength of Web 2.0 is the fact that anybody can participate. The real weakness of Web 2.0 is that anybody can participate. What's at risk are reputations. Now, it's easy to do damage. It's difficult to do repair work. We need much better truth filters out there. And another thing to consider is you're kind of creating business plans around this. You have to understand something, that content contributors are different kinds of people. So when you're making your plans, keep in mind, Slim Virgin is different. Gary Weiss is a different kind of person. I'm a different kind of person. We all kind of came together and it turned into this big thing. So just keep that in mind as you do your planning, that all the normal models, they don't always apply when it comes to content contributors in Web2.0 settings. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions.